Hello, hello, hello. Hi friends, how are you today? I hope you are having a wonderful day so far. My name is Bailey Sarian and today is Monday, which means it's murder, mystery, and makeup Monday. If you are new here, hi, how are you? Every Monday I sit down and I talk about a true crime story that's been heavy on my noggin and I do my makeup at the same time. For the month of October, I thought it would be fun to like do a Halloween look, you know? So that's what I've been doing. And then talking about true crime. If you are interested in true crime and you like makeup, I would highly suggest you hit that subscribe button. I'm here for you every Monday. And I also upload on Saturdays as well. Subscribe, like, comment. I'm being annoying. It's like really early in the morning. I'm trying to film this. Go me. I'm gonna try and hop on Instagram live on Wednesdays. I think it'd be kind of fun. Maybe we can have like a little group discussion about the topic that we chat about here on Monday. I'll probably go live in the evening, like six or, yeah, like 6 p.m. Southern California time. I would say follow me on Instagram and then let's have like a group discussion every Wednesday. How about that? That, that would be kind of fun. I'll do that starting now. Anything else, Bailey? No. So today we are going to talk about the Snedker family. Do, 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 do. Side note, there is a viewer discretion. Sexual assault is mentioned in today's episode. Well, just a little heads up. It's ghost assault. All right, let's get into it, okay? It all starts in 1986, okay? 1986, Carmen and Al Snedker, they moved to a small town of Southington, Connecticut. Now they're moving from New York City, so it's like Southington compared to New York City is, no, why would you go there, you know? It's such a small town, it's quiet, not much going on there, that's okay. But they ended up moving out there with the purpose of being closer to the hospital. Sadly, their son was diagnosed with cancer and he was being treated at a hospital that was literally across the street from the house. So the parents thought, okay, let's move into this house because one, we're gonna save money by not having to commute and two, it's getting really expensive to treat our poor son, so we do need to downgrade. They really couldn't even afford to be living in New York anymore. The family had jumped at the opportunity to rent what appeared to be um, a perfect house. It was large enough for their family, which included three children. And then also they took in their niece, the kid's cousin. I'm not exactly sure why, but they did good for them. So while they are moving into the home, you know, they're just kind of unloading everything. Al, the father, he goes down to the basement and that's where he makes a very odd discovery. Now the basement had seemed to be split up into like two different rooms. And while they're down there, they see that there's like some tools left behind and they're like, what are these things? And they realize that it was embalming tables and different tools. And they're trying to put, the family's trying to put the pieces together. Like what the hell is this? And they realize that the house, it used to be a funeral home. So they look at the paperwork and whatnot and they realize that the, yeah, the house indeed was a funeral home. Oh, hell no. Shouldn't that be illegal? Like you can't sell a funeral home as a normal home. It should be, it really should be. Now, the basement was sectioned into several different little, like little rooms down there. And it was the only room large enough to serve as the two boys bedroom. Now, later down the road, people always are like, why did they make their kids sleep in the basement? But it seemed like to the family, this was really the only option. Like it wasn't just a nasty basement. They turned it into a room and made it look nice. Not long after moving in, Carmen, who's the mother, she says that she began to notice or experience some really strange things going on. She said that things were just constantly disappearing, which at first wasn't like a big red flag because living in a house with kids, I mean, things disappear and move. And you know, it just like, it wasn't something to like totally be worried about, but it was annoying. Then the children came to her and said that there were strange people in the house. 
assuming it's just bad dreams, there wasn't much to think about it, but the children would say they also heard voices at night. They couldn't exactly tell what they were saying, but people were talking and they could hear it. It was whispering. There was like noises, creaking. Is creaking a word? Creaking? Throughout the day, Carmen, the mother again, would hear the sounds of birds outside of the house, but not just like ka ka, like a normal bird. It was hundreds of ka ka's, ka ka, like a swarm of them, but they were all just around the house, either sitting on the roof or whatever, or like flying around the house or sitting across on the little power line, staring at the house, cawing. There's a lot of cawing. Again, I mean, whatever you think, ghost or no ghost, but that's still, it just left a very eerie feeling. I mean, how do you explain that? I don't, I don't know. Birds like your house? So the oldest son, he was the one who was like in the middle of radiation treatment. The family started to notice radical personality shifts and he was becoming very angry and withdrawn, depressed, which was complete opposite of who he was. He was going through like chemo and everything. And it's like, well, maybe it's just, he was mad at that, but the parents firmly believed that it was something much more than that. Maybe a demon. The son, he began to like write, keeping a diary. He was like writing poetry, which is awesome. Love that, wow. But once the family was reading the poetry, they realized it wasn't something romantic and sweet, but instead it was, <laughs> it's not funny. But instead it was poetry with necrophiliac themes. And if you don't know, like necrophiliac is um, having sex with dead bodies, so. That's good. At night, the sun, oh shoot, that was way too much. At night, the sun would claim that he heard voices. When he would get up and investigate, he saw that the walls were filled with dead bodies stacked on top of one another. Now, of course, naturally, as anyone would, he screamed. So when the family came in to like find out why the hell he's screaming, he's like, look, look at the wall. He sees like all these dead bodies just stacked on top of one another in this wall. And the family, or at least Carmen and, the, and his father are like, what? Cause they didn't say anything. So then he tries to have sex with them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's not funny actually, huh? Okay, the, but the, okay, their son could still see all the dead bodies in the wall. The parents were like, well, just go back to bed. Like it's no big deal. You're probably having hallucinations from the chemo treatment. I guess I should have looked this up. I'm not sure if hallucinations are a side effect of chemo. That was what they thought. So as time goes on, their poor son is just becoming more dark, more depressed, more angry, still sleeping in the basement and still experiencing just like weird little things, but not much he could do about it at that point. He, the son, had an intense episode where he attacked his cousin with the intent to rape her. Remember, the cousin's sleeping at the same house as them. Late at night, he sneaks into her bedroom and he tries to rape her. So of course, like the family is just really worried. He's, he's going through treatment. They feel really bad for him, but then he pulls something off like this where he tries to rape his cousin. And it's like, well, shit, what do we do? They feel guilty for calling the police because he has cancer and stuff. He's gonna go to jail and he has cancer. Like they were in a little bit of a pickle. Do you know what I'm saying? I love pickles. Oh, I love a good pickle. Mm. It's easy for us right here to onlookers to be like, yeah, put him in jail. Can't do that, no. You don't do that. But if that's your family and your poor son is like, has cancer and he's going through treatment and he's just having a really hard time. And then he does something really shitty, really awful. Like he tries to rape his cousin. And you're like, well, shit, I just feel, you would feel bad. What would you do? You would just feel bad. Anyways, but the family ended up calling the police, okay? The son was then arrested and taken for evaluation. And when he was taken in, that's when he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. He was then removed from the house and then placed in treatment and he seemed to get better. So then they let him return to his house. So during this whole ordeal, sadly, Al, now Al is the father, haven't heard much from him, right? Yeah. So Al, 
he had be, was like becoming an alcoholic. So Al, the father, he worked a lot, money was really tight, and the stress from the family had really taken a toll on him. He was absent, he was not interested, and he was tired of the family making claims like, oh, there's something in the basement. It was pissing him off. So Al was like, you know what, I'm gonna go around the house and I'm going to unscrew every light bulb in the house because I'm tired of you guys leaving the lights on throughout the night. The family would turn on every single light in the house because it would help them sleep at night. So Al just went around every single light bulb and he unscrewed all of them. So one night while the family was asleep, both Carmen and her niece had different experiences. Carmen said that she woke up in the middle of the night and she said she just felt like this very negative, heavy energy around her. She says she couldn't see anything, but she just felt something and she just felt like it was very bad. Carmen says she then felt very cold hands under her pajamas and it was pulling at her bra. The cousin or the niece was living there, her name was Kelly, and she said she also felt the same thing from these ghosts. But Kelly says that she was sexually assaulted by the ghosts, that at nighttime she felt an evil presence around her, cold hands on her body, and then was raped by a demon. When I first read that, I was like, so, so now not only do we have to fear being sexually attacked throughout our everyday lives, but now I have to worry about being raped by a demon. No, anyways, but she said she was raped by a demon. Carmen, the mother, also says that the ghost sexually assaulted her. She just felt an evil spirit. She felt cold hands on her. And then she just felt this ghost or demon or whatever have sex with her. I, I don't know, you guys, but that, this is what the... But then Al, the husband, the alcoholic, he says he was sleeping one night. <laughs> this this demon is just getting around. Why am I laughing? Is this funny? I don't know because it's a spirit. Anyway, so Al said he was sleeping and he felt the same thing. He felt hands on him. And then he said the demon sexually assaulted him too, like in his butt. When I read this, I was like, okay, let's just say, yes, demons are 100% real. Can it have sex with you? Does that happen? I'm not sure why they wouldn't move out at that very moment. You know, once you got sexually assaulted by a demon, why wouldn't you move out? I don't know. But just for the safety and the mental health of your own children, I would think you would want to move out, but they sure didn't. I mean, again, I think I mentioned this in the last video I did. Like, it's, it's easy to sit here and be like, they should move out, but really financially, not a lot of people can just move. I'm calling myself out. Not everyone can move Bailey. Okay, fine. So throughout the day, Carmen said she would just randomly smell the scent of rotting flesh and decay. And then seconds later, it would just be gone. And nobody else was home. So it was just like a strong scent would just slap her in the face like sulfur, like egg salad, a toot. But anyways, yeah, so they, she would smell something and then it would just randomly go away. So there was one incident when Carmen was just mopping the floor and she's just cleaning. She has her mop bucket and it was filled with water and she had her mop and she was like cleaning the kitchen floor, mopping her life away. Carmen said all of a sudden, the mop water turned blood red. The floors turned blood red and it seemed the mop water had turned into blood. So now like all this cleaning Carmen was doing just kind of went to crap because like everything turned to blood. Now everything's dirty again. Carmen screamed out to the children and when they came in, the floor was normal. So of course, Carmen is feeling like she's going crazy. And how do you convince anyone that the floor was just blood? Honestly, there is like no worse feeling than when you're telling the truth about something that either happened. This is a side note. People don't believe you and you're like, no, this is what happened and it, no one believes you. Oh man, you wanna talk about feeling crazy? That will make you feel insane. Oh, that's my least favorite feeling. Like, I swear it happened, I swear. What do I, how do I convince you? That same night, Carmen said she actually saw a ghost this time. Now, before it was always like feelings and whatnot, the only person who had actually seen anything was the son in the basement. Remember the bodies all stacked? But other than that, no one's really actually seen 
the ghost. So Carmen wakes up in the middle of the night and she just had that dark feeling surrounding her again. But this time she actually saw something. It was someone with long black hair and black eyes. And then another ghost or whatever appeared and it had long white hair and white eyes. And then after that night, Carmen was like, that's it. I am going to contact a paranormal investigator. So she ends up contacting controversial paranormal investigators, Ed and Lorraine Warren. Now they were well known in the paranormal world. And so they call them up in hopes to get some help. Along with a few investigators, the Warrens moved into the house for several weeks until they experienced everything the family claimed that they experienced. During their time in the house, they claimed to have seen firsthand the damage these demons in the home could inflict. Many members of the the team had been slapped, beaten, pushed, slammed into the floor. Just had very unusual experiences. So these ghost investigators kind of do some digging in the house, you know? They gotta figure out the background, the story. And that's when they discover a very dark secret that one of the undertakers at the funeral home was found guilty of necrophilia. This just really fed fuel to the fire. It got to a point that the Warrens deemed it necessary for a full scale exorcism of the property. And then after that, the house was judged cleared by the Warrens. And that should have been the end of the story, but it wasn't. There have been numerous claims by people who lived in the house, both before and after, after the family, that there have never been any evil entities in the house. In fact, the family originally said that they had no knowledge that the home was uh, previously a funeral home, remember? But the house is owner said, no, I told them right off the bat, they're lying about that one. So it was like, oh, that's kind of weird, suspicious. <laughs> the family reached out to um, a horror, horror, not horror, novelist, and his name was Ray Garten, and he would write horror. <laughs> He would write books, right? So the family had contacted him because they wanted him to write a book about their experience. This writer came forward and was like, look, the family and the Warrens made it difficult to write a true, quote unquote, true story because none of the parties could keep their story straight. And it seems like everybody was contradicting one another. And then when he went to Ed Warren with the problem, because he's trying to get this book done, he said that like not to worry, that the family was crazy and just make the book as scary as you can. So this writer was like, okay. so he came forward and was like, look, these people are kind of lying, I think. Now there are other families who lived in the home prior and then after the family that say like, sure, there was occasionally odd, odd noises going on or something, but nothing near the scale as the family has claimed. Whether it's true or not, it makes for one hell of a story. Now to this day, hordes of Photographers, curious cats, and paranormal enthusiasts flock to the home with the hopes of getting a glimpse of the famous house from hell. The current owners, at least they were like the current owners in like 2015, I think it was, they uh, report no paranormal activity and would really just like to be left in peace. They don't like all the people coming around. The Snedker family ended up living in the house for two years after it was exercised and they ended up moving to Tennessee. The children are grown now. Carmen, the one who's the mother, her and Al ended up getting a divorce, but Carmen is now a spiritual advisor. She also has plans of writing another book based on her experience. There are a lot of people who say that this is all made up by the family, whatever. The family sticks by the story and no one knows for certain if anything happened in that house. Now the events of what happened inside of this house have turned into a, I think a couple of books, a Discovery Channel special and a major Hollywood film. Did the family make it up? Was the boy hallucinating from his chemotherapy or did the dead really torment the owners of the house? We may never know the truth. Okay, I'll be right back. I'm gonna turn into my costume. Hold on one second, go. Hey, Friday, bye. Sorry, sorry. Mm. 
It's me, Alice Bitches. Hi. So my mom made me this costume like a couple of years ago and I just thought it was too cute to waste. So I'm wearing it right now. I'm, I'm Alice, the normal Alice, not a slutty Alice, not a dead Alice, just Alice. I just need like a rabbit friend and I need to do some drugs and like start tripping. Yay. Okay, anyways, so let me just close out the story with this because I did a little bit of more research, you know what I'm saying on this story. And there are some theories out there that I definitely kind of agree with. Now these are theories, these are not fact, these are opinions, these are ideas, these are thoughts. And what it's saying is that, remember the, um, the son who was sick, sadly, with cancer. And he was trying to rape his cousin, remember? The theory is that the son was the one who was actually sexually assaulting his mother, father, and uh, cousin. The family didn't want him to go to jail because he was sick with cancer. So they covered it up and said like, oh, it was ghosts. And then they also needed money because treatment is expensive. They were really struggling. So they thought if we just say it's ghosts and kind of like sell this story, we could make some money. And honestly, that sounds like it could be it. Carmen, the mom was trying to convince her kids like go along with the story. We, we need the money. We got to pay all the bills. The son actually ended up um, getting better and was cleared from cancer, but then at the age of like 33 or 34, he ended up passing away from, because his cancer came back, which is sad. I don't know if it was him, but yeah, let me know your thoughts. Do you think that's possible? Cause I kind of think that's it. I, I hope you have a wonderful day today. You make good choices and let me know your thoughts down below. Oh, come hang out with me on Wednesday on my Instagram for like a little chat, group chat. We could do that. I'll be seeing you guys later. Bye.